little biased, but I think this has been a pretty amazing couple days. Everything and more that Dr. Smith and I could have hoped for when we first started thinking about all this two years ago. It has been a lot of fun, and the speakers have just been amazing. Um, and so one of the best things about Brown Symposium, there are so many good things about it, but one of the best things is the concluding panel where our speakers have an opportunity to um, speak in part with each other, which they've been doing some, but speak part in part to and with each other about what they've been uh, hearing and thinking about and including what they've been hearing and thinking about from you and more chances for you to interact with and speak with them. So um, you know all of them by this point, but Anthony Romero and Kelly Johnson and Mika Tosca are here um, to uh, share, I hope, some uh, concluding thoughts or ideas with us, and then we'll open it up to y'all, and we'll see where things go. Hang on, Dr. Smith. Yeah. So I just want to add, I, so when I was in college, I was the kind of person who would never in a million years raise their hand, so there are note cards. If you prefer to write your question down, we will read it for you, or you can just ask. But we're a small group, so it's probably not a big deal. Thank you. You go first because I just talked. <laughs> just straight freestyle. <laughs> Dang. What are your conclusions, Anthony? Yeah, what are you thinking about today? What are you thinking about today after everything we've been talking about? We've been talking about a lot of things like off. Look at you. Moderator. No, 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 go, go, oh. go. Do it, do it, do your thing, do your thing, do your thing. Yeah, 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 okay. you got a skill set. Okay, Let's do all it. right, okay, I'll start. Um, well, just after Mika's talk, what I've been thinking about and what we were just kind of uh, reflecting on on the side over here is um, I really appreciated what you had in your slide that, um, you know, the world is messy. We all know this, and, and we're messy, and I think other speakers have reflected on that in their uh, talks, like Amber um, uh, mentioned that as well. And just that this idea that the worlds that we're building and walking into are also going to be messy, and that's okay. And I think a lot of the time we get wrapped up into this like idea of perfection and making sure that, uh, like Dr. Smith was saying, that we, you know, have like uh, uh, in academia does this too. Like you have this really clear list of next steps, and it all makes perfect sense. Um, and it all seems like it's going to have like the exact right outcome, but that keeps us kind of frozen and unsure uh, about you know, how to proceed if we don't have everything all correct. The same goes for like talking about social justice issues or you know, having difficult conversations. Um, so, so yeah, that's just what, what's sitting with me is like a reminder that it's okay to be messy and it's okay to be uncertain, but to like just keep trying and just keep like making the paintings, like yeah. just keep seeing what comes next without knowing what it might be and that's a really important of the process of imagination, revolution, like just keep taking the next step uh, to see what happens. So that's, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> okay, okay, <laughs> look. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about the radical imagination. That's actually how I'm feeling. In part, you know, there's this great Zapatista quote, we're not asking you to dream, we're asking you to wake up. And I think that sometimes in overemphasizing the imaginative, the speculative, the fantastic, the spectacular, that we lose sight of the realities that need to be produced. Which is in some ways to say that like some, maybe it's just a roundabout way of saying like sometimes the imagination, especially the radical imagination, even rhetorically, which has roots in black liberation, right? Folks like Robin D.G. Kelly, which came up in some of our talks other, is like becomes decontextualized, becomes institutionalized, and therefore loses its thrust in terms of, um, in terms of the action that should follow or should work. And I think that's where for me it's, there's a kind of simultaneity that has to happen. That like, 
you know, even in that quote, like we're not asking you to dream, we're asking you to wake up, is a call to action, right? It's not a call for some sort of speculative event, but rather to like root oneself in the realities of the moment and then move forward. Performance scholar Diana Taylor reminds us that sometimes we get lost in what should be done and in choosing the right option. I think you were speaking to that a little bit too in sort of that narrow solution set that you were talking about. But Diana Taylor calls us to think about what we can do as opposed to what we should do. And I think I was like really sitting with that across, um, across the last couple of days. And there's something I think, like to pin all those things back to something that you said, Mika, is like when we think about the ways in which oppressed communities have managed to create beautiful realities for themselves, we often see that they do that not, um, that they do that by simultaneously imagining and enacting that alternative, right? So like dance worlds are a really great example of that, right? That we can see, you know, anyone who's ever spent time in a sweaty club at a queer dance party in the middle of the night, surrounded by all these bodies, knows that moment of catharsis and um, rootedness in one's body and like the body collectively in relationship to other bodies producing something despite all the things that are terrorizing you in that particular moment, because that's what it is. An older version of this, or older version of this, but maybe a sort of like, you know, in, in your line of inquiry would be like Hakim Bey's idea of a temporary autonomous zone, right? That like, there are these moments in which we're able to carve out for ourselves and for our communities, these autonomous areas where we can self-determine, where we can be free, if only temporarily, right? So that's also the thing about the party. It's like the party is a temporary moment of liberation, but it's still a moment of being free. And maybe the last thing that I'll say, this is just, I'm just freestyling here. So the last thing I'll say, there's like, there's no chorus. I'm just puking it all up. It's making me think about what I have to say, so thank you. Yeah, I'm just yeah, buying you You're time. buying me time. I'm just yeah. buying you time. You bought me time, I'm just paying it for it. Um, but the last thing I would say, and I think this is where I really struggle with the radical imagination, is there's a, a wonderful artist in Boston, who, or I guess they recently relocated to New York, named Golden, who's a, an amazing poet and a photographer, and I encourage all of you to read their new chapbook, who really celebrates black, trans, queer communities, taking portraits of their friends and loved ones, and writing beautiful poetry about all of their experiences. And I remember sitting with Golden one day, and Golden said, in relationship to their experience in those, like moving through all those positions in the world, that they weren't no longer interested, I'm paraphrasing Golden, so Golden, if you see this at some point, I'm sorry for butchering your words, but the, um, that, you know, often we say like, we're trying to build the world and we're trying to build towards that future where we can be free and Golden really reframed that for me and said, like, I'm not trying to work towards being free. I am free, and I'm just trying to set the conditions that allow me to stay free. And I think that shift is part of what, you know, I've been sitting with the last few days, because, like, I'm not trying to imagine that thing. I'm trying to say I'm already that thing, and then I'm trying to imagine how to stay that thing. So I'm supposed to follow that? <clears throat> okay. That's like all your thing. <laughs> I said all your thing. A couple of things that you just said actually that really resonated with me and actually right before I, I ran up here, he had to leave but Dr. Long, Josh Long, uh, was saying to me um, that so often we think about, uh, we talk about futures and imagining futures and we, you know, even present it as this like thing that we can make great and then we talk about the past as though it was like, the, the, the good old days, right? Like that was like, that was when it was good, especially with respect to climate change. We're like, it was good then, and maybe we can make it good, or maybe it's gonna be apocalypse, but we rarely talk about the present and like what, what we're doing now to sort of like build these, these places. And it reminded me that someone said this to me, and now I can't remember who, so I apologize if you're watching this and I'm stealing your words, but they said something like, we dream about the future all the time, but we actually never make it to the future because we're always in the present. 
I don't know, there's probably a quote about that, right? Like, as we get to the future, it's the present for us. It's never, there's never actually, we're never actually going to get to the future, right? I guess it depends how you think about it, but we're not, it's always the here and now. And something you just said is like, um, you know, as we build these worlds, yes, it's, it's lovely to sort of imagine them and to dream, dream big or whatever, but um, sometimes we build these worlds out of necessity, right? We build them because we have to. Because I, I built a queer world for myself in Chicago because I had to. I, I needed it to survive. I needed it to get through. And that reminds me also of Javi, the, 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 my student who I work with, because, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you mentioned, like, dance spaces. And obviously, as you all can tell, I'm obsessed with that. Um, and that's what I'm, that's, I want to move in the direction of that with my, with my work. But I do really think the light bulb went off for Javi when I took him to, uh, to the uh, festival that I spoke at, because I spoke about his work at the Hancho Festival, and I was like, Javi, you should come. I'm talking about your work, and I'll get you a ticket. And I think it just totally changed his whole outlook on life. He was like, oh my god, we can actually live in this place of joy. We can actually create these worlds that are good and joyous, and it doesn't have to be the apocalypse, even if the apocalypse is happening all around us, or however you, you want to think about that. And I think that was a big light bulb moment for him, because he was like, I can be in this place of joy, and I can make work that's in that place, even if everything around me, like you were just saying, is messy, is is dirty, is confusing, is complicated, right? Um, but that's just in response to what y'all just said. I also have a few notes um, that I took of things that resonated with me, and the thing that um, continues to stick with me, and I thought about like last night, the whole night, is something that you said in your talk, Anthony, yesterday, and I'm going to paraphrase you really poorly, but you said something like, performance is not only the ideal space in which to imagine futures, but also to enact them. Um, and that endurance and perseverance proves efficacious. And I think that that resonated with me because that is also, as someone outside the art world who's like really begging you to let me in, um, is that art can be this place not only to imagine, but also to enact. And Octavia Butler has... Um, I'm also obsessed with Octavia Butler, and she has a, a, a very uh, popular quote, which I'm going to paraphrase, but it's something like, science fiction is not only about the problems of the world, but also about solving the problems of the world. And so I think that art can not only help us imagine and all these different things, but can actually also help us literally solve them. And I think I talked about that a little bit with the design work that I did. And then finally, something that um, Amber uh, said yesterday, which... Uh, I have to pull up from my Instagram story because um, <clears throat> that's where I put the note. Uh, she said, they said, um, hold people and systems accountable without holding on to the pain of the trauma because if we hold on to that pain, then we'll replicate the power structures that actually caused the trauma in the first place. And it literally made me cry um, because my tenure process last spring was incredibly traumatic. It was um, the some men in my department were horrible, uh, to put it like, I won't get into all the details in case they watch this someday. Um, actually, maybe I should, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> but but I, I've held on to that trauma for like almost a year now, and I actually think I finally let it go yesterday, um, which is really nice, because I think that we, we have to let that trauma go to move on from it, and it was, it was bad. So anyway, I'll finish with that. Any questions? Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, we have some questions. There's some from the exhibition. Yeah, sure. So one of the questions that came in, and I'm curious to hear y'all's answers uh, as well, uh, is what piece from the exhibition resonated with you the most and why? Um, so if I have to choose one, my favorite piece in the show was Olivia Olivia's um, quote from Andre, an Andre Lord poem. Uh, which read, uh, to make love to concrete, you need an indelible feather. And I just, I love the, like, the way that the piece is made. It's um, molds of letters that uh, have plaster and gypsum and squid ink uh, and glitter and pieces from, like, other works that she's made kind of all, like, layered in. Um, and uh, to me, that phrase is like super complex but also very simple 
I mean, the act of making love to concrete is pretty ridiculous. Like, <laughs> I mean, you, you know, you just imagine that um, uh, in your head. Um, and then this idea of needing an indelible feather to be able to do that act. Um, I, I was explaining it to some friends last night because they were like, I don't, I don't really get it. Like, what does that mean? So um, you have indelible feather, meaning like something that, um, you know, lasts over time. Um, uh, and, you know, I imagine like, essentially, right, like <laughs> rubbing a feather, like playing with a feather on concrete, eventually, after a while, like you'll notice some mark making. I mean, it might take a really, 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 really long time, but you think about like water moving through landscapes, like eventually it does start to shift and change. So just having that kind of metaphor in mind of uh, persistence and playfulness and something soft impacting something that's very hard and very immovable um, gives me hope and persistence when I'm feeling, um, you know, like nothing's changing or um, that like I need to be soft. It reminds me to like return to my softness, uh, especially when I'm feeling really stuck or, um, you know, have, like having a hard time getting through to someone at work or, you know, laugh with my partner, like lots of different things I feel like it, it applies to. So um, that's my favorite piece from the show. What about, what about y'all? If you remember, uh, or, or I won't, yeah. I, I won't remember what it's called, but it was the bird with the Arduino um, thing. I just like the synthesis. I mean, it's very solar punk to me, and obviously I'm obsessed with that. So I just love the synthesis of sort of like invoking the natural world, but with this like clearly like synthetic electronic. And I just think that stuff that my students and students at SAC do with those Arduino things is cool as hell. So I don't have as nice of an answer as you did because I'm not an artist, but that one spoke to me. Honestly, I loved all of them though. Um, the one that was projected onto the wall with all the colors was amazing as well. I liked the reading room in the middle. Maybe that's your artwork. I would. Remember. That's how I would frame it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. You can, like, but that was your artwork, and it was nice. Um, you know, in part because the other thing that we said, you know, and something I say to my students all the time, and I'll say to all of you, is like, stay hydrated, stay moisturized, get lots of sleep. You know, those are really like the three pillars of <laughs> things. If you can manage those three things, chances are you're going to do all right. Um, and I like that. I like that invitation in the exhibition. And I just want to make a quick plug. The, the exhibition is meant to go like hang out in. Um, so go hang out uh, like in the reading room, like pick up one of the zines if you need a break from your studies or like just something different to do or like bring your homework in there. Like, I really meant that for that be, to be a space for you to like get recharged, get inspired, take a break. So, and you know, pass that on to your friends. Like, just go, go hang out in there. Yeah. Okay, I found a, a question here that I really like. I think it's a little lighter, so maybe we can move to that for a second, and then you guys can talk about all these really heavy art qu uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> just kidding. No. You work this, at an art school, huh? You work at an art school. You have opinions. I work at an art school. You yeah. have opinions. <laughs> This one, it says, asks, um, do you have any thoughts about artificial intelligence? Um, do you utilize it? Have you submitted any papers or talks through AI for results or comments? And do you get feedback uh, from mostly fellow academics or the public? So um, I actually have thought about AI a lot. Um, and I, mm, this might drive me out of the room, but I think AI is really cool. Uh, I think like what we can do, so okay. Let me rephrase. AI, um, it, there's a thing that's, that's AI, and then there's a thing that's AI that is in our brains that we think AI is, and I think we think AI is like replicants uh, from Blade Runner, reference to Blade Runner again. But actually, AI as it currently exists is sort of just pooling together all of human knowledge that exists in like a digital form usually, right? And creating something from that, whether it be art, uh, art or like papers, manuscripts, that sort of thing. So um, like if, let's say you wanna write a paper on like, I don't know, the Cuban Revolution, right? Um, it'll pull from all of the available, available knowledge that's online or, or exists digitally and create that thing for you. But it's never gonna be as good as if you had done that research yourself. Um, 
no matter how much of that knowledge exists because it's not a human being doing it. And I just really believe that human beings have um, something important to offer the world when it comes to not only gathering together evidence and researching things, but also producing knowledge, right? We, knowledge doesn't just exist, we produce it. It's a thing that we produce. Um, I talked about it in my, in my talk when I, when I mentioned that we worked with the design team and that actually working with the de design team help us, helped us actually do better science, right? Like produce better knowledge. Um, as a scientist, we like to think that we're always um, seeking the truth, right? Like that's what we're, we're trying to uncover the truths about the world. Um, but we often forget that we're people that are doing that, right? And so who are we making that knowledge for? Why are we making that knowledge? What are we researching and for what purpose? And I think that's all questions that AI can never ask itself. Well, not yet anyway. Um, maybe someday, I don't know. Uh, but currently, um, right, like the art that AI makes is never going to be as good as art made by a, made by a human person. This is, it's just something that, that it doesn't have the ability to do. Um, but I do tell my students that if they use AI, I'll know. And I have actually found one student who used the chat GPT and I was like, this is wrong, <laughs> right? Like there's parts of the paper that were, were wrong. Um, and they were probably, you know, they weren't wrong in the sense of the knowledge itself or the information itself necessarily wrong, but it's like the interpretation of the knowledge and how the knowledge is collated and, 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 and presented and, and, and analyzed and all of that stuff. So that's stuff that I just think AI currently can't do and maybe never, never can do. Um, that's my thoughts on AI. Do you guys have thoughts on AI? Uh-oh. Angles. I mean, first I would say, like, if folks are really interested in, in AI, I would encourage you to, Alicia mentioned this, I think, in the first talk, but I would encourage you to follow folks like Suzanne Kite, who's part of an uh, artificial intelligence indigenous protocols working group who have a position paper on the matter on artificial intelligence as it relates to traditional worldviews um, and indigenous knowledge, which you know, both is attempting to one, map the ways that indigenous knowledge systems are often co-opted or, um, or appropriated by Western scientific methods um, in, in order to, to help produce machine learning algorithms. Um, some great thinking on that. But also to think about like, well, what, what is useful about that technology for indigenous people, specifically and what my protocols look like. Around that, and as my, as I said in my talk yesterday, you know, protocols are, are sets of arrangements in which we recognize paths of knowledge in this case. So one example of that would be like peyote medicine. So if folks are a member of the Native American church, there's a peyote medicine ceremony. But the story of that is that the knowledge of, of peyote, of the cactus, and its medicinal uses come from the deer. It was uh, knowledge that came from the deer to the women and then spread throughout tribal communities in this area as a result. So part of the protocols is to make an acknowledgement to deer who helped share that knowledge or who did share that knowledge with the women in the community. So how do we think about those kinds of things in relationship to artificial intelligence or what you're saying, which is just like a dump of knowledge, um, whereas for many peoples around the world, knowledge exists within really specific ecosystems. As I said yesterday, indigenous knowledge is local knowledge. So it, it's to decontextualize it is also to lose something of it. Um, there's also other folks, I mentioned a book called Sand Talk, How Indigenous Knowledge Can Save the World, which is a great book by Tyson Yunka Porta, who's an Aboriginal scholar um, in Australia, obviously, and is doing a lot of work thinking about indigenous knowledge systems in relationship to climate and sustainability, which is what that book's about. But Tyson Yunka Porta is also part of an Australian-based um, think tank on indigenous protocols around AI and machine learning technologies. So just encourage folks to, to think about those things because as you might imagine, all of these things are inscripted with bias because humans are producing the code. Even if the machine takes the code and runs with it, humans are producing that code and they're inscripting bias in there. And there's lots of really interesting things you can think about it. There's a great Claudia Rankin who wrote Citizen has a really great interview in which she interviews an AI. <laughs> Oh, it's Alexa. She interviews Alexa. 
Um, it has this long back and forth with Alexa about what Alexa thinks about racism and white supremacy and stuff. So that's a very fun interview if you want something a little bit lighter. Um, but in general, you know, my position out of these things are like probably humans will just do terrible things with it because that's what humans do. Um, and it, it, it sort of comes down, you know, it's sometimes what I say to my students is like the difference between a knife as a weapon and a knife as a tool is the direction of the blade and the amount of blood on it. That's kind of my position on AI. Uh, I don't have any interesting things to say on AI. I feel like I haven't thought that much about it, so <laughs> no comment from me. <laughs> well, I will say one more thing that just came up in one of our faculty meetings, which is very fascinating, is that we did at uh, the museum school, at the art school that I'm at, we got the first AI produced portfolio in admissions. And this has like sparked this question over whether or not there should be like uh, rules or policies in place for how to receive AI portfolios. Interestingly, the head of admissions for the art school was like, if they had just written a statement about how that was a conceptual project, I would have just said it was fine. But they were passing it off as their work, which is like always a very funny sort of art. Yeah, yeah, you see the difference? Like if they were like, oh, if you just made an argument about it, that would have been cool, but you're like passing off this machine thing. I feel like there are artists who are making AI work, but it's like very intentional that they're right, making yeah, it. Yeah. Like it's yeah, intentionally AI. Yeah. Yeah. Also, thank you for mentioning Claudia Rankin. I don't know any performance artist that has not mentioned Claudia Rankin at some point during them, themselves talking. <laughs> it's true, don't you think? That's on record. Your shadiness <laughs> is on record. It's not a shame, it's just like funny. No, yeah, funny. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Maybe we could talk about what role galleries and museums play in climate slash social issues. I mean, well, you're a climate scientist. Yeah, like what? <laughs> Expertise. What do, what do you see? Oh boy, what's the question? What role do galleries, museums play in climate, climate and social, issues. social issues? Oh boy. Um, <clears throat> sorry, it's been a long it's been a long morning. My flight also this evening got canceled, so it's I'm like, that was a whole thing. Um, okay, what role do <laughs> galleries and museums play in climate? Social okay, I actually have kind of a long winded answer to this. So a couple of years ago, I sat on a panel for the Chicago Architecture Biennial, um, and they asked us to define art. Uh, and they had like me, a climate scientist, they had a mathematician, and then they had a few artists. And um, we never actually agreed on a definition. That was the result of our, of our, we met for two days. It was like 12 hours of talking to each other. And we never came up with a definition of art. But something that we did talk a lot about, how, about is how the average person, AKA me, non-artist, views, used to, I guess before I came to SAC, used to view art as the, as the stuff that's in museums and galleries. And how that's like incredibly, uh, it's an incredibly gatekept world. And who is gatekeeping it um, are, I'll venture to say people that are unlikely to care that much about climate and social issues. Uh, that's not a broad statement by any means, um, but I just don't, like, okay, I might go on a tangent here and I apologize. But I think that <clears throat> a lot of times when people uh, in positions of power, which I would argue like a museum coordinator or a, or a gallery coordinator would, would be, um, they think about the climate issue in uh, really reductionist ways. I think they think about it as like uh, this box that they can check off, like I care about the climate because I did this thing, right? Um, or I, I, I showcased this art. Um, and I think that that really does a disservice to what we actually have to do with climate change, right? We have to do far more than that. We have to do more than just buying a reusable Starbucks cup. We have to actually create this, this different world. Um, and so I think that if it was up to me, um, I think that galleries and museums would play no role 
in, the, in, in addressing climate change. Um, I'm very skeptical of museums. Maybe not galleries as much, but, um, but museums, I'm, I'm just, I'm very skeptical of them as someone who's not within the art world. So you guys might have very different opinions than I do, but I'm just really skeptical of like the Art Institute of Chicago, like having a climate um, exhibition. I just think it would be horribly reductionist and it would make all these like rich white liberals uh, pat themselves on the back. Like I went to the climate show at the Art Institute and now I care about climate change. Um, and I just don't think it works like that, <laughs> you know, or they'll, they'll do like a, a retrospective on like um, a black Chicago artist um, and all these like white liberals would be like, oh my God, their work was amazing, blah, blah. I'm like, did you know about this person before the, and stuff like that? So it's, it's very like, um, it feels very performative. And uh, so, <laughs> so I, I, I just, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that if they do have a role, it should be, it should be limited or they should talk to me or someone like me. Or a fee. First. What's that? For a high fee. For, for a very <laughs> high fee. <laughs> well, so this is, I, I think this is a really interesting question. So I work at the Rothko Chapel uh, in Houston, which is a, it's not a museum, it's not a chapel. I mean, we say a lot of things of what we're not, but what we are is um, a, interfaith, intercultural, sacred art space that does do programming at the intersection of social justice, spirituality, and culture. Um, so we do try to, so we are in an art space and we kind of are a museum as well. Um, so we do try to, through programming and mainly programming meaning like panels, conversations, lectures, uh, meditations, even concerts that try to connect to social issues, including the environment. Um, that's something that uh, we do have high on our list of like, but, but it's more about using, so the chapel is a space that we use, much like the library space in the exhibition, it's like creating a container through art to be able to have a different kind of conversation than we might have like in a space like this about climate change. Um, so I do think that is a role that museums and galleries can play is like, I agree with what you're saying that there is a lot of stuff that's performative, especially in Houston, because a lot of the institutions are like funded by oil and gas, and it's very problematic, and it's a conversation that we're having all the time, but it's very complex. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's a whole nother, I think, conference and in, 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 uh, conversation on its own. Um, but I do think a role that, that they can play is to be a container for different kinds of conversations and to just by way of the environment um, and like what's on the walls, right? To like put your, put people in a different mindset um, and to get creative and to think, right? Like outside of the box. So I, I do think that um, that's something that the Rothko Chapel I think does really well. What are your thoughts? <clears throat> okay, there's two buckets. One is like super general and then one is like really specific. So super general is um, abolish museums. We don't need them. We can just get rid of them. We can also abolish universities. We don't need those either. Um, and the <laughs> then following that line of thought, if you're interested in going through that, there's um, an incredible collective of artists activists called Strike MoMA, who have written a number of papers on that especially thinking about this kind of back and forth between exactly as you pointed out, like trustees, money, and how money filters through museums and enables this, quote, space to have difficult conversations, but in fact is, is like a, um, it does all the things that, that y'all mentioned. And especially thinking, you know, for them, for, for Strike MoMA, thinking about folks that, um, folks like Warren Kanders, for example, which sits on the board of, of the Whitney Museum in New York, and um, but is a war profiteer who is responsible for producing weapons of mass destruction that are used in Syria um, and other places, as well as producing the tear gas, which is used on the Texas-Mexico border against migrant families. So you have folks like that who sit on the board, who funnel exorbitant amounts of money into that, um, you also have folks like um, the, um, there's a great book called Empire Pain, which is about the, um, what are their names now? I can't remember the family. The Sackler families. 
And the Sackler families, for those who don't know, also were part of the Met and had a secret room inside of the museum in which the Met held their collection but was also a space for them to have private meetings um, inside of the space of the museum. So that's on top of like museums being places where like artifacts that are in the next room, which were stolen from indigenous peoples and oppressed peoples around the world exist. You know, we go through this all the time at the MFA in Boston, as I, for one reason or another, have, am invited, I'll go home and do this as soon as I'm back, I'm invited to have internal conversations with their staff about how to do DEI work in the museums. This happens all the time. One of the first suggestions is always like, we'll give all the shit back that you stole, and they're like, well, but aside from that, like, what else could we do? And then, you know, the other things would be like, divest from oil and gas, and divest from the prison industrial complex, and all those kinds of things. They don't want to do those things either. Harvard's a really great example, just for folks who, who might be curious. Um, if I remember right, it's like nearly a quarter of the endowment at Harvard is actually invested in the prison industrial complex and in folks like Warren Canders, whose corporation is called Safari Land, whose money is being utilized, um, is really being produced as a result of global conflict. So this happens all the time. I'm sure it's happening here. Happens everywhere, so abolish all those things. General, I mean, like more specific, sorry. More specific is like, which museums are we talking about? You know, like, Mexicarte is not the same as the contemporary, just to use two local examples. And there is a rich history, you can see this with like the Studio Museum in Harlem, for example. There is a rich history of culturally and ethnically specific art institutions which offer different and alternative models. Leslie Lohman Museum in New York, which supports queer and trans non-binary artists is also another really great example. So there's like the general answer and then there's like the more specific because you know it doesn't necessarily always do us a service in our analysis to like lump all of these things together. Um, as far as galleries are concerned, maybe just the final thought is like, I don't know, I'm not in a good position to talk about this. Like, I have a, an ambivalent relationship with being an, arvid, an artist. Um, you know, as I say to my students, like, art is only useful to us until it's not. Um, so I am also someone who often abandons art. Um, but I, but, you know, I recognize I'm also like a professor of art, and that's a privileged position, and da 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 da, -da so. Humans are messy and complicated, that's what I heard today. <clears throat> you made me think of something that I wanted to add, if that's okay, but uh, I guess, Thinking about museums, um, another form of museum. I know we're talking about like I guess what people consider art museums or whatever, but um, <clears throat> there are also natural history museums, which people are like, that's a good place to to talk about climate change and blah blah and maybe. But uh, we have like the Field Museum right in Chicago, which is an example of this. Um, but it's important to remember that natural history museums while they often don't contain artifacts stolen from indigenous people around the world or whatever, they still contain artifacts that, were, um, that are there because of colonizers and colonization. I, when people from Europe and the global north were going around the world colonizing various places, they were also encountering skeletons and animals that they had never seen before, um, like peacocks, right, which they brought back to England um, and that sort of thing. And um, they brought them back and they put them in these cabinets of curiosities, um, which became natural history museums. Uh, so I'm not even sure that natural history museums are in a place to talk about climate change, actually, from, from that perspective. Maybe they are, but they're, 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 they're probably equally as bad. But I think a lot of people will be like, what about natural history museums? And it's like, I don't know. I, w I would just add natural history museums often also contain True. the remains yeah. of indigenous peoples who were collected, much like the birds, because yeah. indigenous peoples are often synonymous with land, so you find the repression of one following the repression of the other. And just to note, because it's also a local issue, is uh, the Miyakan Garza Coltecan Band is advocating, has been advocating for a long time, because UT owns hundreds of remains of indigenous peoples, um, and are refusing to return it. So if folks are unfamiliar with that issue, I would encourage you to read um, all about it because universities are also these sites of um, study of the natural world and other things. Um, I mean that in a very, like, if it, like I would have italicized it if I could, you know? Other. Yeah, yeah, other. Yeah, 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 exactly.
what should art of the future look like? Raves. Question and mark. Anthony is saying raves. Uh, I guess Wait, can I be more specific? Yeah. Well, just make it lighter because I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, let's like, make it know, lighter. Yeah, let's yeah, make yeah, it lighter. Yeah, yeah. This has gotten real heavy. So, like in the Matrix Three, in the third one, yeah. the rave that happens underground. Are folks familiar with this? Look, like, if you haven't watched all of the Matrix movies, watch them all. They're incredible. And in Matrix Three, I mean, they're not incredible, but you know they like do a thing. <laughs> no, they're incredible. <laughs> <laughs> they, you um, were right the first time. <laughs> They, um, there's a rave, you know, they're like going to war with the machines again, or like whatever, a battle in the long war with the machines. And they hold a rave, something I think about all the time, actually, because, you know, like Morpheus gives this very impassioned speech about going into battle, and then there's this like rave, rave sequence. Important. Anyway, is that, is that yeah. the art of the future? <clears throat> actually, rave? thank you for bringing up the Matrix, because uh, I'd like to talk about the Matrix, actually. And specifically, the reason that I think this is a perfect analogy is because the creators of the Matrix are two trans women who actually have transitioned since. And Lily is one of my really good friends. She lives down the street. Um, and we've talked about this a lot, about how that was purposefully done, <laughs> that the rave is there for this exact reason. And then a lot of the world building in the Matrix is for this exact reason. Where Lily and I have often clashes that the Matrix is pretty cyberpunk, and I'm like more solar punk, you know? So it's the same idea, but a little more dystopian. But they still build a better future in this dystopian world. And it's like an, almost an analogy for the way that trans people build these like futures within this world around us that's trying to eliminate us, right? Um, and so I think the Matrix actually is a divine example of what art of the future should look like. Raves, yes, thank you, Anthony. I completely agree. Well, just what that made me think of and something that, um, to, to just like add on to what I was talking about last night with the exhibition is, um, you know, having moments of joy before action or like before making a big decision or, right, like before, like we make better decisions when we're joyful, relaxed, well rested, like supported. And so hydrated, hydrated, moisturized. 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 <laughs> always forget moisturized. I got, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so that I don't know. That's what I'm thinking about. Is like, how do we? I like what you said about like we're already free. Let's just like you know make the conditions so that we can stay that way. And so, yeah, I, I don't I don't know what art of the future should look like, but I think that it would be awesome if it was made from those spaces. Um, instead of a you know sense of urgency, um, or you know of all of us being exhausted, I just I'm really curious like what what does what does that world look like uh, when we're all working from those kinds of you know better situated places. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I I also I wanted to say too that um, I think art or you know any creative practices of now or into the future should just, I mean, they should look like practices and performances. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, something that Kim and I were talking about is this idea of just practice in general of, of specifically like practicing joy. Like it's not something that, um, it's something that you should build, you could build into your life. Um, uh, the example of like Kim gets these beautiful flower arrangements delivered to her or not, not this big, <laughs> but like uh, delivered to her by a local woman-owned like wildflower business uh, regularly, and that's something that brings her joy. Um, and I think that's really beautiful. And you know, it doesn't have to even necessarily be things that you buy. Um, it could be you know, like every Sunday you take a walk down to the park and like look at the water. Mm -hmm. um, it can be like you go take a nap outside and get some vitamin D. Like, um, so I, I think that, yeah, we should be thinking about building practices too for ourselves um, and for our communities. Yeah, <clears throat> you just made me think of something that, um, that I think will, is funny. I, I, my students, are, I asked them on the first day of, of school, like, who's scared of science, right? Everyone raises their hand. Um, and by the end, I'm like, look, you're all scientists. Or I say often, like, you are all scientists, we are all scientists. And then I'll later, at some point, be like, well, I'm not an artist. And they'll be like, Mika, you said we're scientists, so you're an artist, right? And I'm like, 
something that I think about a lot is art as a, as it's defined, like this question is asking what art of the future should look like. And my students, a lot of my students will be like, art can be whatever you know you, you want it to be some, in some case. Like I'm not explaining it correctly, I don't have the words for it, but it's like um, <clears throat> I would love for us to more generally, more broadly break down these divisions between these various disciplines, like this is art and this is science and this is something else, like poetry or whatever, right? So even at our school, like we don't have theater because theater is not art, I guess. That's what, that's what I've been told. That's what I've been told. Um, and so, you know, like th that just pours a lot of uh, fuel on the, on the fire of why we should actually just kind of get rid of the, the delineations, period. But so what art of the future should look like, um, I don't know. I don't know that anyone could even could even necessarily say that, right? Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, what are you going to say? Go ahead. I, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think art of the future should just be super collaborative. Yeah. Um, I mean, and that can look all kinds of different ways, and it should look all kinds of different ways. Yeah, totally. Whenever Anthony is thinking, it's really intimidating. He has this really <laughs> intimidating thinking face, like, like he's just about to say something super eloquent. And he is. Don't drown us all, so go ahead. <laughs> wow. I'll turn my microphone on. I want a copy of this. Keep in my receipts. Um, here's the thing. In the same way that I'm suspect of the radical imagination, I'm also suspect of the future. In part because that suggestion relies on a linear experience of time. And so I think for me, it becomes more useful to reframe it as like, um, as cycles of regeneration, right? Like it's a position shift. You know, sometimes we can think of a cycle as a circle, but if we shift our position, we see a cycle as a spiral. And that's useful for us, you know? And I think about folks like the Red Nation, which is a collective of indigenous activists who produced a really incredible zine during the pandemic called Communism is the Horizon, Queer Indigenous Futurism is the Way. And that is like the perfect, you know, for me, the summation of, of what we're getting at because we, if we understand that thinking from histories of indigenous peoples, from the perspective of indigenous peoples, queer indigenous feminism existed prior to contact. So it's kind of a return, right? Nick Estes, who's a member of the group, wrote a really incredible book called Our History is the Future. And that's part of it, right? Like, it's, it's not so easy as to say, like, well, we're a, in the process of decolonization, we're attempting to return to something prior to contact, because we're not, because that doesn't exist anymore. But what we are saying is, like, there were things that existed before. There are things in our past which are our future. And that's part of that, you know, and I think that's, that's true across all the work that we were thinking about, is that in part what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, like, you know, if, we're, uh, if we follow folks like Mark Fisher, who wrote an incredible book called Capitalist Realism, Mark Fisher would have you believe that, like, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. But if we add people like Ursula Le Guin to that, right, like Ursula Le Guin said, or Le, Ursula Le Guin followed that by saying, and in the same way, we couldn't imagine anything other than monarchies until we did, right? And I know that's what we're trying to get at in terms of the radical imagination, but those are also things which are situated in our historical past. Like we might not be able to imagine ourselves past capitalism, but if we remember what existed before capitalism, it enables us to utilize that in a cycle of regeneration to return, not in a sort of idyllic backward sense, right? Because I would still be thinking linearly, but to return in that sense of that spiral, that cycle of regeneration, to move forward, right? To propel ourselves forward to something that is like a future which is born out of our past, which really we just call the present. Yeah. There actually is no, right? We've already said this, but there really is no future, actually. It's just the present. I mean, there is a future, but it's, it's just now. When, and then when we get to the future, it's going to be now. Exactly. And that's, and that's that, you know, like, to, just to go back to, to the example of Golden, is like when, when I'm sitting with Golden and they're like, 
I'm already free, I'm just trying to stay free, they're existing in that past, future, present moment right. because their experience as a black trans person is, is liberatory already. They're just trying to keep all the shit that wants to keep it, all the violences that are threatening it away so that they can stay in that present, future, past moment. Definitely. I mean, as a, I'll comment on that really quick while we're regrouping. As a trans person, thinking about future was really interesting because I didn't think I had a future when I was younger. Like, I thought I would be dead when I was 32, whether it be by suicide or something else. Sorry, trigger warning. Um, <clears throat> but now I'm here, seven years post-transition, and it's nothing like what I even could have thought, even a year ago, right? Which is why the, the future doesn't exist. It's just the present. I, I'm, I'm very firm on that. I think it's like... I don't know, someone said it to me a long time ago and I'm like, wow, that resonates, that continues to resonate. We're constantly trying to plan for the future, thinking about the future, but actually the future is just now. And when we get to the future, it will just be now. But see, that's actually the thing, okay? Because it's like a navigational device. That's really what we're talking about. Like when we talk about the future, we're just trying to orient ourselves in the present. So, I, I, what I find useful so I'm not trying to be prescriptive because I don't have answers. I'm just like a person that moves through the world and messy and complicated and all those things. Um, I'm not though, I make my bed in the morning. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, well, cause you know, like we're setting up a dichotomy that some of this is like a clean thing and a messy thing. And you know, next thing we know, I'm like supposed to be using the right fork when I'm eating my salad. Um, where was I going? With oh, the horizon. Okay, so here's the thing. Right? Like in that formulation of the Red Nation, like communism is the horizon, is a way of saying the future without saying the future. But really what it's saying is like, it's using the landscape as a way to orient ourselves in the present, in relationship to what's behind us and what's in front of us, right? And you hold both of those things at the same time. Right? That like when we stand out there and we see the horizon and we see that big blue Texas sky, we know where we are and we know where we're going. And that becomes what's important. Now, if you put a building there and you can't see the horizon anymore, then you have no idea where you are. This is why for folks like myself who grew up in rural environments and then moved to the city, as soon as I got to Chicago, I was like, what's happening? Because I couldn't see the horizon anymore and it became disorienting, right? So now we replace all those buildings with capitalism, ableism, transphobia, sexism, et cetera, and we can't see the horizon anymore. So we don't know where we are. And after you live so long in that environment, it becomes disorienting to leave because suddenly now you have an expanse where anything is possible and you become scared. So you wanna build more walls and you wanna build more buildings because you're comforted by that. I'm gonna ask the next question so I don't have to answer it right away. Is there an artist whose work feels particularly relevant to any of the symposium topics you, that you'd like to mention? I mean, every artist in the show. <laughs> And I feel like, wow, I, I feel like we could create a really amazing reading list from all the books that were mentioned, um, which maybe, okay, that would be awesome because I want that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I actually, maybe I do. I have a very like sort of straightforward, if people are looking for like names, I know a lot of uh, artists who are working in the climate art, climate space um, that I've had the opportunity to <clears throat> um, interact with. So one of my absolute favorites is Sarah Black. Do you guys know Sarah Black? She's a sculptor. She's fucking great, like so good. And we had a, uh, an in-person um, art show at our conference that I think I mentioned and her sculpture, um, it's called 7,000 Marks and it's actually like these pencils that her and her collaborator carved out of a tan oak tree that died because of a disease, a, a, a disease that's afflicting tan oaks across the uh, west. And it was just like 7,000 pencils on a table. Um, and it's a very powerful piece. Um, so I, I, I thought that that was 
Amazing. I, there's also a sound artist who I have worked with, um, also from Chicago, who I think's work is um, particularly timely in the art and climate space. That's Kiku Ibino, K-I-K-U, with a little, and then Ibino, H-I-B-I-N-O. Those are two of my faves, if people want like actual names, yeah. I mean, I guess there's maybe just a couple other facts that I would add. Um, yeah, so, okay, so very quickly, there's a, um, an interesting design studio in Boston called the Design Studio for Social Intervention, um, who has done some really great work, including writing a number of, of really amazing pieces during the pandemic, starting with um, social justice in a time of social distancing. It's a great starting point. Um, Erin Genia is an indigenous artist, um, also based in, in New England, who's thinking a lot about climate um, you know, from an indigenous perspective and creating really beautiful Erin Genia, G-E-N-I-A. Um, and uh, has a project around um, social emergencies which has identified this sort of cultural moment as a moment of social emergency. Um, it's actually in the last Gaspism book, I don't, the book we edited, we included her diagram about the social emergencies in it. And then the last person is someone, Mika, that you just made me think of, which is a former uh, grad advisee of mine named Eli Brown, who's doing some really amazing work around intergenerational, um, two things, like one, thinking a lot about climate from a queer trans perspective, and then two, like this really incredible community project around um, around intergenerational trans dinners and bringing groups together. I mean, just you made me think of it because of the, your comment. So those are a couple. And as as you were talking, I was thinking of there were actually a lot of. Um, I probably have a list of artists that are just aren't coming to mind that like just couldn't include in the exhibition, but there are a couple of thing there are a couple of publications that come to mind. Um, Dean Magazine is a uh, uh, black collective design uh, magazine that looks at social justice issues through a design lens. So if anyone's interested in that, um, they're really cool. And uh, just generally, like I've been trying to just look at more. We were talking about publishers last night. Um, but publishers that make interesting art-related books um, of fiction or poetry or you know graphic novels. So AK Press is one that came to mind, um, and there are many others. So I, I think also just remember to you know like art comes in so many different forms, um, and you know look for the spaces that are bringing uh, different messages forth through publishing as well. Yeah, I'm sure y'all have other. Uh, yeah, but I'll just email them. They would just go on and on, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm such a nerd. Um, I don't finish everything either, just just for the students in the room. I'm a very promiscuous researcher, so it's very like, okay, but, yeah. I'm in this I moment, and then I'm in this moment, and then I'm in this moment, and I just, you know, I just ride the wave. That's called research. That's just how it's done, you know? I think, Is that your scientific opinion? I think, I think that's my scientific okay, opinion, mean? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how research is done, right? I don't know. I think that's how it's done across. But anyway, sorry, not to take away, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just saying it's not, it's not like I like read all these books. I mean, I read all the books, but I'm like, you know, like read the books. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then sometimes I just put my hands on it and I try to like absorb Sorry. it by osmosis. Yes. Like I'm like, what do I think this is? <laughs> um, or you like ruminate on it. Like I'm like slowly reading Abolish the Family, which is a very fascinating book. Um, and uh, is also an incredible book to read if you're a parent. <laughs> and, um, but it's, it's like, a, you know, it's sort of like that. Like I read a little bit and then I just kind of like have it next to me. You know, sometimes you have to like get up the nerve to read something, yeah. you know, that's part of it too. So like those things, like they live by my bed and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna read that. You know, like Salvage Collective wrote this book for Verso. Have you read it? The Salvage Collective, they're like a climate justice collective, and they wrote a book for Verso that is um, so depressing. I mean, unbelievably depressing. Like, there's a snippet of it on the Verso website, and it begins with this detail of uh, only having like 60 harvests left. Like, that's the image that they're conjuring, is the amount of harvest. 
the book is a couple years old, so now we've got like 57 harvests left. Well, I sent it to some friends of mine, just to your point, in your talk, I sent it to some friends of mine, and I was like, let's, maybe we should all read this together and cry about it. And then, um, but now it's become this like ticking talk because they start with this image of the fields, of agricultural fields, and how many harvests are left before the end of the world. And um, yeah, it's very doom and gloomy. The small chunks, you know, like a little bit at a time. <laughs> and then like, listen to Miley Cyrus or something. We have one. Yeah, anything, like literally yeah. anything. <laughs> lighten it up, lighten it up, lighten it up. Well, let's see. This says, uh, what ways do you envision there's room to expand viewers' engagement with contemporary art? Yeah, you just take it to them. That's all. You also do have to make it accessible. I, I think, like, a lot of people ask me this question. They're like, how do I, as a I give a, I give a similar type talk to a lot of science institutions, scientific institutions, and they're always like, I really want to collaborate with artists. How do I, how do I do it? And I'm like, when I think about it, actually, I'm like, it took me a lot of work to learn how to talk to artists. Um, as a scientist, we're not trained that way. It's hard to, to, you know, describe that in five seconds right now, but. We're just not really trained to, 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 to speak in that language. So I, I often say that when I got to SAIC, I became um, bilingual in science and art. I can speak the language of art, and it's very actually different than the language of science. Um, and it's interesting, at this conference, I've been speaking in both languages. I've been alternating between the two, um, which is hard for me. It's, it's a complicated thing. So I think that the ways that you, you expand viewers, viewers uh, viewership and, and engagement with art is to make it more accessible. And that's the same thing that can be said about science. Now, how we do that, I don't know. I don't but know. like, not didactic. Not, not like, didactic. Not like, there's this thing, you know, that happens where, at least in, in terms of, you know, community, in, socially engaged, what we sometimes call social engaged art or social practice or any of these ways of making art that involve like going to people as opposed to asking people to come to you inside of the gallery or the museum. But there is also this sense of like, when you make it accessible, you're dumbing down essentially the content. I don't think you have that necessarily. Um, yeah. And that's like, because people are always smarter than you think they are. They might not be interested, but it doesn't mean yeah. they don't understand what you're talking well, about. Well, that's what I was going to say is like the way to get viewers to engage with contemporary artists to make it interesting and relevant. Like I think this yeah. this actually goes back on the artist. <coughs> is if you if you want people to be engaging with your work, like make it interesting, <laughs> make it relevant, think about what the audience is going to experience. And if, and if, and like have some, especially as you're, if you're an artist and you're working on your practice, um, or you're writing or whatever, like have somebody close to you read it or like experience it and ask them like, what do they see? And if they're not getting some threads of what you're trying to express, then like you need to come kind of come back to your process. So I think this should actually, question should be thrown back on the artist to think about it. Yeah, there's a, a one, one great example is Alison Mitchell and a bunch of other artists created this queer feminist haunted house. And it's a super fun, fun environment where like you go in and there are all these stereotypes actually related to the talk, the talk yesterday in regards to histories of feminism, but all these characters like spooky characters, there's like a women's lib like zombie room and things like that. And it's all these sort of jokes, but you're kind of moving through this space where all of these tropes and stereotypes are these like comedic kind of scary figures. And then you get to the end and they facilitate a conversation about mm -hmm. um, patriarchy and sexism and homophobia and all that stuff. But it's like a bait and switch, you know? You're yeah. like, come for the fun haunted house and then stay for the political indoctrination. <laughs> consciousness yeah, raising. I meant consciousness raising. That's what I meant. Yeah, I guess when I when I said accessible, I don't necessarily mean did, I know what you're saying, but I think even that conversation at the end of that feminist haunted house can be inaccessible. And I think that that, that that's like a it's, it's a big problem. And I think that what you said about like have someone read it, have someone who's not an artist Absolutely. actually look at it because I, 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 there's a, something that really sticks out to me. I'm not an artist, right? But I do work in an art school, so I'm I'm very much enmeshed in this like cultural thing and I do I do feel like it's I sort of have an outsider's insider perspective and um, 
one of the most common ways that the average sort of non, you know, artist way that, that they'll engage with art is they'll go to those like little pop-up Instagram art places like the Yayoi Kasama uh, infinity color. rooms and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and I remember saying it once, I don't know, I think there's like the ice cream museum or something, right? Like that's one of them. And I think that most people actually interact with that type of art more than lots of other types of art, whether we want to acknowledge that or not, whether we think that's good or not. But I remember talking to a, to, talking about it to a friend and they just kind of like stuck their nose up and they rolled their eyes and they're like, that's not art. And I was like, this is exactly why art is inaccessible to actually think a lot of non-artists. Wait, wait, can I, can I give an example that I feel like you'll find yeah. like Please. horrifying? Yes. So I have a small child. We go to the science museum all the time, um, especially in the winter. And at the Science Museum in Boston, there was this exhibit about rising sea levels. Um, as I mentioned this to, to folks before, but a couple years ago, there was this pretty damning report that came out, and like a third of Boston will be underwater in the next 20 years. And so there was this exhibit about it at the museum, and it's a science museum, so it's, everything's interactive. And you go through, and you see like Venice sinking, and you see all these other things that are explained to you, and it's, it's all this projection mapping and images of buildings being submerged. And then you get to this um, ice cream shop. And it's the projection of a storefront of an ice cream shop. But it has physical elements that you can interact with. Like there's a door and all these things. So we're standing there. And my son was five at the time. And we're standing there. We're looking at it. And I'm like reading the label. And I'm kind of explaining to him what it's meant. And all of a sudden, this alarm goes off. And in the projection, you see water start to rise. And on the screen, it flashes. And it's like, prepare the sandbags, prepare the sandbags. And there are these bags in this box that you're meant to like stack up in front of the door to save your ice cream business. And you're suddenly thrust into this incredibly um, anxiety, like ridiculously anxiety-inducing experience of trying to shave your business that you didn't realize you own, but suddenly you own it. Like I'm emotionally invested in this business now. And I'm like shoving all these sandbags in front of the screen and my son's just like, what is happening? And I'm like, we have to save our business. <laughs> and um, if, you, if you're able, and it, but it also, it's like there's a sensor there, so you're being measured on your ability to save the business. So if you can't stack the bags in soon enough, you lose your business and the big red light goes off and if you can, a green light goes off. Anyway, what's your opinion on such installations? <laughs> I'm afraid to issue my opinion, but I, I, I it sounds fun. I don't know. I'd love to save that ice cream shop um, as long as they have vegan ice cream. Yeah. But I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that is, it's very didactic. I think it's very, like, explanatory. There's probably a space for that type of art. I think it's accessible, but I think there's also space for other types of art. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the type of art is, is it is what it is. I think sometimes where I get lost is when we talk about the art. I don't, like, I learned all these words. We have to do critiques. I learned the word, like, materiality and, like, stuff like that. And I'm like, what is, that's a made-up word. But it's not. Anyway, that's what I'm talking about. And thank you thank to our you. organizers who Absolutely. put on an incredible symposium. We were also going to say thank you. Thank you.